you know, yeah. I grew up drawing and wanted to be like a, a, a cartoonist, you know? Yeah. Do you still draw? Uh, yeah. Especially with my girls. Yeah. That's great. Jared. That's great. I wish I didn't. You, you look like a cartoon, you know? <laughs> This season of Good is sponsored by Musicbed. Musicbed represents over 700 indie artists and composers with record label quality music for you to license. Also, check out musicbed.com for more information on their subscription service, giving you unlimited access for all your projects. As a good listener, you can get one month free off any subscription type. Just head to musicbed.com good and use coupon code good at checkout. This season of Good is also sponsored by Film Supply. Licensed stock footage from world-class filmmakers. Plus, if you're short on time, they have free footage research available to help you find exactly what you need. Learn more at filmsupply.com. Oh, dude, it's good to see you. You too, man. You always look I mean, la- oh, <laughs> right back at you. You know, last I saw you, I think, was a, a picture of you in the hospital, um, yeah. which was exceptionally disheartening. Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm pretty much back to normal now. You look great. Thanks. You sound great. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the fam, yeah. I'm I'm assuming the family's great. Yeah. Yeah, everybody's good. I mean, that was a um that was a pretty harrowing November for sure. Mm-hmm. Um I mean, you know, I was like sitting in there as like I could hear through like from different rooms people just like moaning and like yelling. It was terrible. Just when like, you think about when you think about your mortality, do you often concern yourself with your own individual mortality, or now that you're a family man, and I mean you're well loved by so many, yeah. you love so many in turn, do you think more about them and how and, and their mortality and how and how you know your inevitable passing would affect them? Yeah, probably probably that the most. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, of course I'm, I'm definitely like thinking about the things that I want to do and accomplish and what I want, want my life to be without it being too like uh um cliche. I mean, yeah. I mean, I was, you know, thinking about, I don't know. I, I definitely had like several days of just uh, really sitting with what my life is, like what I've kind of ma- <clears throat> made it into decisions that I've made. I mean, you know, look very like self-reflective on like a, a pretty deep level. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's like the main thing is like, what does their life become if I'm not around anymore? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Maria was in there too. So, I know so that was, you know, th- thinking through all of that, but um, dude, I, I, I <clears throat> was like sitting in the hospital bed just watching the masters cause they got like rescheduled to November because right. and I, it was at the point, if this gives you like some kind of picture into it, I was like really just watching like so jealous and kind of amazed at um, people just like walking around and like um, without like worrying about their ability to do that, you know? Like Mm -hmm. I really was just watching kind of like, God, I can't wait to get back to the point where I'm like not having to think so consciously about breathing and and my energy and my fatigue and walking around or being, not being able to walk around or whatever. So yeah, that was weird. I mean, for, you know, for days, that was like the only thing that I would watch because there wasn't much (laughs) going on. Um, And it was just like, it's so beautiful. Like even just like um, being out, like the thought of being outside, like they were, you know, um, and like walking through like beautiful, like bright green grass and just like hitting a ball. And like, I don't know. It was like, man, I can't, I, I, I wish that I could do we, that. We as a family, my siblings and I had bought my dad tickets to the masters and yeah. it was so fucking sad and disheartening to basically be like, you can't go, you know? Yeah. <laughs> oh man. And it's such a fucking drag. I mean, are you, do you, do you golf? I didn't know. No. That. I didn't know that. I'm no. a sports guy. Mm. What's um, your sport of choice? I played baseball my whole life. 
That's what right. we've I'm talked about. I'm this. We, what is this? Uh, this is just that I kind of haven't seen you in so long, you know? I know. I know. Oh, uh, yeah. I played baseball my whole life. But um, I'll be honest, that. baseball is hard to to be a spectator, especially like television, like watching baseball on television is really difficult. Whoa. I don't know about that. I mean, you don't think so? You know, the World Series this year was out standing well that's a little bit different sorry last year sure you know same thing with like i mean basketball is more fun to watch because things are happening on a, at a kind of quicker it's kinetic clip. Mm-hmm. yeah um but uh yeah w- w- when even like when basketball gets to the playoffs and things start to matter more it's like a big because that's the, the problem with baseball is like 162 games in a season and it's like mm-hmm. it's a haul you can mm-hmm. win, you can win or lose you know most days and of course you know those those will add up to like you know whether or not you go to the playoffs or not but no no one day is that consequential until like the end you know so it feels like have we ever yeah no i totally hear that i mean have we ever talked about moneyball okay well it's funny you mentioned that no we haven't (laughs) we haven't really (laughs) that was that was one of the um for some reason, uh, I put that on. That was the first movie I watched when I got back home from the hospital. <laughs> yeah, that's a delight. <laughs> <laughs> I watch that movie maybe once a month. Okay, hang on a second. I'm gonna have to <laughs> Are, I, 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 um, I'm on Letterboxd. You ever heard of Letterboxd? Yes, before? yes. Um, I, I don't want to. Well, I'm kind of ruining it now. Make it too public because I don't want to like. You know, I don't know a ton of people like uh, the. the who are making the movies that I'm talking about necessarily, but enough, this is all going to come back to bite you. <laughs> yeah, enough that it could be a problem. <laughs> um, but I have to find this because I, I have to, okay. November 16th. I said, I can't believe how absolutely perfect this movie is. Honestly, one yeah. of the best movies of the last 20 years. I'm not sure how I'd let myself, or I'm not sure how I'd let myself love it. How I didn't let myself love it enough before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's I, I think it's a near perfect movie. Like as I mean, it has this ineffable quality that, you know, I I talked to my good friend Ben Collins, who lives right next door. We talk about it all the time because we're like, what is this movie doing that's so that's so um pacifying, right? Like it's yeah. so it's so gentle. Well part of, of it is like just film. that it's about mm-hmm. baseball. Yes. Yeah, no no doubt. And I, I, I really ascribe to that. Um, you know, I am a huge Bennett Miller fan. Um, I think, you know, I think the guy is excellent. Um, I, I really wish he made more films, you know, um, was the last one Foxcatcher? Is that right? Yeah. Which is fantastic, you know, but by comparison, you know, it's such a dirge of a movie by comparison, like Moneyball has this levity to it, um, while being like innately human, you know, um, and uh, it just makes me feel good when I watch that. Yeah. Movie. <laughs> How much of it is, is, um, well, I mean, I think it's Jonah Hill's like best performance ever. It's so strong. I mean, he, Jonah's great in Wolf of Wall Street. Oh yeah, that's true. But yes, he's, he's fantastic in that. And then it feels so natural for, for Pitt too. Mm-hmm. He definitely yes, has, uh, yeah. he like personifies like kind of that, um, the yeah that kind of like calming like soothing uh presence that baseball kind of has a little bit it's so interesting because i mean that movie had such a journey um naturally i I kind of you know started like doing deep dives into research um after i realized oh man i really love this movie and i guess soderbergh was attached originally Mm -hmm. to do it which is you know i mean i'm a huge soderbergh fan and i would have loved to have seen that that um you know, rendition of the movie through, through his eyes. Um, but Bennett makes a lot of sense coming from like documentary background. And I think yeah. his utilization of certain techniques, you know, especially within the edit kind of just blended really well to create yeah. something that felt very naturalistic, you know, um, and very relatable, um, where it is about baseball and it's not as much at the same time. And yeah. Um, it's not like a typical sports movie in, in yeah. a certain sense, right? Um, well, none of the athletes feature. I mean, maybe correct. kind of, but not really. Mm-hmm. Which right. Is an, an interesting way to approach a sports movie. I think so. Yeah. I mean, I like 
the genre of sports movie. Like I just watched Queen's Gambit and I'm like, this is a fucking sports sh- mm. movie show thingamajig. You know, this is like the perfect, like, it's basically like boss battle after boss battle, you yeah. know, it's like every episode, <laughs> it's, it's so good. And I'm like, how fantastic to like, you know, apply like a sports genre to, to a game of chess and yeah. find a dynamism within it. You know, I was really nervous when that, sh- when that, sh- when I started watching that show, at the at the onset i'm like i hope this i, I don't know I, I was afraid that it would diverge too far away from the actual games of chess which is yeah. like you know maybe i'm like, like them sitting down to play like you want to see i'm like play. give me that <laughs> give me that i'm like i mean i love searching for bobby fisher i'm like that movie fucking rips yeah. you know i'm like give me a lot of that type of stuff <laughs> and it did and it delivered and i thought it was i thought it was really really strong one of the best, one of the best openings in a pilot, like the be- the first ten minutes of that pilot, Remind where me. she's just I, like. I, I also racing. watched that when I was like uh, COVID. <laughs> when you, you were all did it up on yeah. on you know like, uh, <laughs> yeah yeah on your Everything. COVID drugs or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. The she wakes up and then she's just basically racing through this palatial kind of you know um, compound yeah, to get right. to her to you know her show off with like the master yeah um and it's just so dynamic and it's so well conceived and and visually designed and it just throws you through this gauntlet kind of immediately and i'm like well if this is the show then like yeah. I'm, I'm on board you know as soon as it flashed back to her as a kid i got nervous i'm like shit yeah. is it gonna be like this type of fucking deal let, let me, but let, do you do you feel like through it well thinking about so i love mad men but um yes. i remember thinking while i was watching it i mean it explores like obviously a lot of interesting avenues but i always wanted more of don don um presenting his ideas you know what i mean i, I love like, I, that's my it's my favorite stuff yeah honestly like the whole thing the, about like you know kind of you're talking about her, wanting to see them play chess that's how i felt with don was like i want to see him yes. like, be a genius yeah, 100%. I'm with you. Like, I, I wish I I've, had more of that in that show. I've gone back to rewatch just like the highlights from that show of yeah. like the best pitches, you know? I'm like, yes. give me the best pitches. <laughs> yeah, it's totally. The best. Or like, <laughs> it's a pleasure, man. And, like, you know, has been laboring over it, over it and doesn't know what he's going to pitch. And yes. then just like his brain engages and, you know, that's the best. I, I'm with you. I watched, um, I watched Rounders for the first time last night. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, oh God, back in high school, man. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I mean, that's, I would probably put that in the same like conversation of being like a sports movie. That's really interesting. I mean, because that's Ed Norton, Matt Damon. Damon um, yeah. Who else? There's some other fella or um, lady, right? Uh, no, not really any of the leading women or names that you would know. Um, gosh, I'm trying to remember now. Uh, I should know this guy's name. What's the guy's What's the guy's name in Big Lebowski who who uh, licks licks the bowling ball? Totoro. Yeah, he's in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Malkovich. That's right. It. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. This is this is funny. In my mind, I always blend it with Suicide Kings. Remember that one with Chris Walken. Seen it. God, that that was a strange one. I can't really even speak to that movie because when I saw <laughs> it, it was like a different lifetime. Yeah. Um, but that came out about the same time as Rounders, I recall. Um, like and in reaction to rounders or or it's just one of these adjacent kind of things i think yeah. that like and 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 kind of drew the same type of audience probably yeah. um um but god no it's been so long since i mean i'm a i'm a also a big ed norton fan you know so i, I probably yeah. will go back and watch that movie now yeah. Thanks for reminding me. Living alone. What's what's no, I don't have name? roommates. I I have, like I said, Ben Collins, you know. Yeah. Um yeah, you know Ben. Ben was a screenwriter yeah. in Super Dark Times. We're, you know, we work often together. Um uh Ben is a best friend from college and happens to live directly next door. He could yeah. probably hear me say his name <laughs> right now. You know, it's a yeah. different apartment, but it's right next door. We so are you guys all. able to to hang out? Are you kind of yeah? We hang out level? all the time, and honestly, if Ben wasn't here, I would be. I don't know what the fuck would happen. Yeah, Ben. I mean, he Ben was stuck in Argentina at the beginning of all of this for about Whoa. three months. Yeah, I was stuck in South Africa, and he in turn was in Argentina, but he stayed there much longer. Yeah, um, with his girlfriend. Um, 
Yeah. And so, I mean, we've been, how to say it, keeping each other like alive. So that's a little dramatic. We've been, sure. we've been there for one another, you know, <laughs> yeah. we watch films and like, we really don't do anything dangerous. We go to the grocery store when we need to individually. But aside from that, there's, I mean, Los Angeles is kind of dog shit right now. To be yeah, honest. It is, it's yeah. like, there's really, there's really, you, you know, I've had to start maintaining or implementing rather like a really strict kind of routine. Um, that I haven't been used to, and it sounds so obvious, but, you know, pre quarantine, pre all of this shit, you know, my life kind of more or less revolved around, as you know, being a filmmaker, like, you know, job to job yeah, and traveling for the work. Um, and I would do a lot of traveling and I would often kind of find myself in different places for certain amounts of time. Um, I mean, like last year in 2019, I keep saying last year, 2019, um, I was in, you know, I was in Los Angeles, maybe like two months of the year, you know? And so my home here, um, wherever it may have been, because I've I've moved a number of times since I've lived here for like 12 years, the home has always been something like a base, but it's, it's always been, uh, like, um, how to say it, it's a bit transitory, right? It's a bit like, I never settled in. I always, I always, to this day, feel like I'm a tourist in this city. You know, I don't, I have my places that I go if I need to, that have, that those have changed a little bit. But I guess what, what, what this is all to say is that like, um, work has created the routine for my life, so to speak, because, you know, you go off and then you come back and then you're like, thrown through this dilemma of like, what what do I do now? Because, you know, this schedule that was, you know, made for me is no longer there. So you need to kind of implement your own thing. And this past year has, has proven to me that like, Oh, I, I am, I am completely running my own life here. And, um, all this to say, like, you know, I just get, I get up like super early in the mornings now, like I get up at like, you know, 445 and I, I go for like long walks when it's just like completely quiet Um, and that's been extremely pacifying. Um, uh, but that's it really (laughs) that I come back and, you know, it's, I mean, it's gorgeous here. I'm looking outside right now and it's like so beautiful. It's Los Angeles. It's gorgeous. You know, when there's not like, you know, uh, terrible fires and stuff, you know, it, uh, yeah, the sky's, the sky's blue. Um, but it's a tough time to be here. That's for sure. I mean, this yeah. is a city that, that, you know, even before all of this was, is, is built on an infrastructure of like kind of isolation, you know, yeah. it's like people live here so they can have the quiet that comes with, you know, the way the city is laid out um, and add this pandemic on top of it. And then it just yields more isolation, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I don't know. Yeah, I haven't seen anyone. That's a long way. It's a long, <laughs> long spiel of saying that yeah, I haven't really seen that much of anybody. Yeah. Let's, well, maybe this is for people who don't know. We can talk about how we know each other. Um, sure, whatever you want. It's, it's, I'm very interested in your take on this because I don't know if we really knew each other until like after you were gone. I remember we played, do you remember us playing dodgeball together? Yes, I do. <laughs> I wouldn't have recalled unless you brought it up, but I do. And you, yeah. you, um, I have a distinct memory of you, uh, kind of freaking out on like the ref, and we got kicked out of a game because of you. You, you really? Yeah, you came and played with. Uh, it was like me and Sam, and like Josh Jones. Yes, Mike. Yeah. Bailey. <laughs> um. I got you guys kicked out of a game. Yeah. yeah. Wow. The, amazing. I don't remember that. You I got to say, I got to say, I'm not surprised. You know, <laughs> I was a bit intense back then, you know? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I think I don't I'm know chilled how much out. Listen, li- listen to me. I'm yeah, like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that, that was like the, I would say the adjective because to frame it up a little bit, like basically when I, so Kevin and I both went to SCAD together and um, 
your, I know you probably hear, I don't know, I don't know how much this comes up, but like your class was like legendary, probably still is legendary from SCAD, like in the film department where it was kind of like, and I mean, I'm not trying to be whatever, but like my class, there's a handful of people who are even still in the industry, much less mm. like, um, you know, like really working at like a level that, that I'm sure they wanted to when they were in film school, you know? Right. Um, and I remember you guys leaving and it was just kind of like, I mean, such a crazy percentage of, of people from your class that are like doing really great and making like amazing work. And even before it was like break, you were breaking into like the actual industry. It was just the work that was being made even at school was like kind of unbelievable. What's your, what's your kind of like uh, memory of, of all of that? Does it seem like that to you or is it something like that I'm making up as an underclassman? No, I mean, I think, I think that's pretty accurate. You know, I want to, I mean, honestly, you know, looking at, looking back at that moment in time, like, you know, it's easy to recognize exactly what you're saying, that there was a tremendous amount of talent for some yeah, yeah. insane kind of reason. reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was like culminating around a couple of those years there. I mean, r- right above us, I think the class above us had the Ross brothers, you know, basically, yeah. um, yeah. who are doing fantastic work right now. Yeah. Um, and a slew of other filmmakers too, but it was in this kind of period of years where, yeah, again, for whatever reason, that school managed to like, you know, um, manifest like a tremendous amount of talent, especially within the film department. Um, and a lot of us, Here's what I'll say. I think this is this is what I, this is you know me giving the school a real pat on the back. Um, they really fostered um, relationships, like interdisciplinary relationships. Yeah, I liked I liked the experience so very much because um, we were provided the opportunity to mingle with other departments. It was very much an art school in that sense. You know, yeah. it, it, you know it's it had a great film program in that there were some tremendous professors who I, I still regard extremely highly. Um, and I have to ask who I have to ask who uh, Lubomir, Michael is Cheney, he's still there? Bear Brown. Uh, Lubo is still there. I mean, at least as far as like two years ago, he was still there. I remember right. I, I actually, I saw him at the Savannah film festival. We, it was a, a beautiful experience. Like out of oh. like, yeah, it was a fant- it was like out of like a Gus Van Sant movie or something, like kind of going back and like <laughs> yeah. talking. You know, it was really incredible. Um, I mean, I yeah, I I have nothing but absolute respect for for all of these people. Did you ever see Lubo? Did you ever um, almost said Lubo? Did you ever have a class with Roger Rawlings? No, Cinema Studies. No, maybe mm-hmm. it was after. No, mm-hmm. did you ever take any of those classes? Yes. Um, I mean, I recall Cinema Studies. Yeah, there was one. Oh God. Early on, I had a cinema studies class. That's where I met John Lynn, actually, uh, our buddy John Lynn. Yeah. Um, I forgot the professor. She was great. Um, but that was so early into my, my college career there. Um, I remember my art history classes like, very well uh, with Selena <laughs> Jeffries and Emeka <laughs> Nanawe. Like, the, they, that, those, were, those were classes I really um, took to. Well, that's what's great about SCAD too is like, you no know, doubt. I took like 3D design and it like changed yeah. my life, you know? There you go. Yeah, exactly. I mean, on uh, it was like this double edged sword for me because, on one hand, like I absolutely appreciated the like the liberty that came with it and almost the kind of not just liberty, but there was like, this feeling that like you're going to land on your own two feet no matter, no matter what you do here, right? Yeah it really instilled the desire or not the desire as much as the, the idea that, you know, it's what you make of it. It's like Jodie Foster says in contact, like she's like, life is what you make of it. And it's like very much, very much true. It's like, I don't think you, you have to want, like quote somebody that specific for that line. <laughs> I love that movie. I watched that movie. It's speaking of Moneyball, contact is a film uh, that I will watch, uh, on any, on any day, whether I'm like super <laughs> sad or not. And I'll just put that movie on. I'll probably put it on after this. Uh, this is ambience, but <laughs> 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 this conversation um, is making you so sad. Oh, it, it, doesn't, it takes very little to make me sad these days. Um, I, I feel like, um, something about scatter a school like that is like, 
you know, it's not that there aren't like, I'm taking a sip of water again. Announce it. <laughs> not that there aren't, um, you know, like film school, like kind of like what you would imagine, like as a typical film student at SCAD, because there definitely was. But I think something yeah. about SCAD kind of draws pe- people who maybe are just more like, have a, have like a more, diverse interest in in art or creativity that's how i felt about well, this is what i'm talking about yeah 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 so it's not this just what like I think is- they just come in like wanting to make a tarantino movie i'm sure there's people who are like that but Surely. also you know yeah. i grew up drawing and wanted to be like a a, a cartoonist you know yes and that was kind yes. of my my like like uh way in to just like um being creative at all and then do you still draw uh yeah, especially with my girls. Yeah. That's great, Jared. That's great. I wish I did you, more. You look like a cartoon, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to take more life drawing classes lately. Um mm. something I've been trying to, to do, but obviously it's kind of impossible now. I when when I was really God, this is gonna sound so fucking pretentious. When I was really young, I was re- and I mean honestly, and even a little bit to this day. At its broadest, most like base foundation, I was always kind of yearning to um, like capture kineticism, right? Like to capture kind of whether it be like the human body in motion um, or just, I don't know, any sort of kinetic fervor um, within the natural world. And uh, certain anime really seemed to kind of uh, lean into that type of propulsive quality. And I thought that... Yeah, and I could just get lost in that. Yeah. I can get lost. I could get lost in like um, any sort of kind of you know, like like a few frames of 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 you know a certain of a ninja scroll. Like you know when like like how Jubei kind of you know pulls his sword out. And there's this gleam of light across the sword. It's like that <laughs> yeah. shit is fucking so awesome. And it's like, and I don't know. It's like it's again like you know for me the best the best films the films that i want to kind of always watch forever and um, the things that kind of sit with me and stick with me are, are films that really account for the assemblage of their elements and so it's yeah. it's the the gestalt thing and so a lot of great anime naturally like neon justice evangelion like akira obviously like ghost in the shell these are films that are so designed and have such an uh, such a perspective, such an actual kind of single point of view, um, where they're taking into account everything that the medium offers, from visuals to sound to story, and it's the it's the culmination of all of those things together that really create a feeling. And so for me, it's like it's it's very easy for me to kind of go back to that stuff, you know, yeah. as to get a feeling, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I remember um, really kind of, I mean, gosh, this is going to be such a throwback for you, dude. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, you know, we've talked about this a lot, so I don't think it's going to be like um, out of nowhere, but I mean, just the amount that I would like watch what you did was a lot. I really, I, I know, I know we've, I know we've talked about this, but I was like, really, really, and not because we were doing the same thing necessarily. Um, it's, it's hard to describe because I knew that like my sensibilities were different, but I was just kind of, I think maybe, um, just something about how specific you were, like drew me in very quickly. You know, my. I, I... In a way, I feel my sensibilities have leaned more towards the sensibilities that saw within you at a younger age too. Mm-hmm. Like as time has come to pass. Yeah. I kind of slowed. I don't know. In a way, I guess. I, well, I mean, I, I was just, I was just watching like the, the glorious stuff today. Yes. And the way the camera, I mean, you know, uh, there's 10 of them, so I don't know if I can get all of them straight, but um, and I, I want to talk about that specifically. Um, but the one where she's, I think it's the third one where she's drinking and yes, holding the baby glory, and, yeah. and the way um, yeah, yeah. the camera like dives in, you know? Like, yeah. 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 That's yeah. like classic Kevin Phillips right there. And that's cool because I mean, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry, please. No, no. I just wanted to say like, I really, that means a lot to me if only because, you know, there are moments in my life 
where I'm like, I yearn to get back to that type of energy. Dude, um, I get it. And there's like a weird desire where sometimes I want to be really placid and really mm-hmm. static. Um, and with something like this, that na- had a natural propulsion and rhythm to the song, there was a desire to, br- to, to really kind of lean into that and, and embrace that type of energy. And, and so, you know, for you, for you to recognize that, that mean that really means a ton to me. What is that whole project called? Is it just three? Is that the it's three? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's the name of the album. Um, right. Yeah. Um, I, I want to dive into that, but I, <laughs> it's just so many things specifically, uh, even the way that like she throws the bottle and it bounces off of <laughs> six different things. <laughs> yeah. I, there is something about the way that you capture it, like an object moving <laughs> i mean it's very specific and just like the, your your inserts are always like fascinating to me something i would never think to do but i'm always like damn it that's like not that it's easy but it's so simple um and and, and so useful like thinking about um stuff that you did in super dark times or too cool for school yeah it's like you know the 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 disc spinning in the in the discman you know or like when he jumps over the fence in too cool for school and like the cord wraps around the fence you know like all that stuff just feels um so simple like i would have seen it before but the way that you do it is so specific i mean i want to hug you be, you know for every reason but just the fact that you can kind of remember how the cord wraps around the fence in that <laughs> in that like literally like you know four frame shot in that in that movie i remember when we were setting up for that for that uh shot and my producer bless his soul i love him so much was just like do we really need the fucking setup for this fucking shot and, and i'm like yeah it'll make it in i promise it'll make it in um i mean that's yeah there's a desire to be this is the game, right? Cause like you desire to be precise, you know, but yeah. at the same time, like you, you realize that precision can totally be the death of you. And like, yeah. if you, if you get too clinical, it can be very dangerous and, 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 and it could be, it could be feel soulless, you know, and mm. it could be like a huge detriment to the project. And so it's this, you're, you're trying to strike this balance constantly of, of not wanting to be too try hard, but yet wanting to really um, give the film what it what it wants. There's like a it's like yeah. this balance of like indulgence and you know restraint totally. constantly. Um, Do you feel like and, that's been like the journey for you? Is is um, learning what your like restraint looks like? Yeah, I think that that's the forever journey. You know, I think that naturally will change itself over over time. Like, I mean, because I think your restraint versus like, you know, Bellatar's restraint, <laughs> are gonna be <laughs> you know, so the, I, I mean, I said that like specifically, because I don't, you know, I think you have there's like different rule and i think this applies to any different like, you know, film yeah, yeah. You have different rules for what that looks like for you, you know? Yeah, I think exactly. I think I try, and I don't know if this is true, but I try to tell myself early on, as, like in college, I remember like, you know, sitting at a, a cafe in South Carolina with Ben, you know, um, like at some ungodly hour, as we used to do at the Waffle House or something, yeah. and chatting about all of this stuff, about theory, about filmmaking. And yeah. and I, I, I came to some conclusion, this is when we were making the world outside or something like that. Yeah. Um, then I was like, you know, I think that what this is, is about like creating boundaries for yourself. This is something yeah. I failed to do in relationships, but <laughs> yet managed to do in, in, uh, in filmmaking, so to speak. It's like you create boundaries and you're, you're creating a universe that the movie lives in. Um, and that helps just kind of guide everything, right? It, it helps to yeah. guide every decision, whether you break those boundaries or not, that, that comes, that comes into play as it will come into play, but you got to start somewhere. And I think, you know, and whatever those boundaries look like for, for me, it's usually, it's less about story boundaries and it's more about, I don't know. It's like about like cinematic form boundaries. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it, 
Yeah, I, I don't know. It's like, as far as restraint goes and moving forward, um, it all comes back, God, I, do, I, do I really say this? I think it all comes back to the story. You know, I think it does. You know, I, I always challenge myself with this. There are times where I'm like, man, fuck story. Like, fuck off with like all of this, like desire to like, you know, gotta tell a fucking story. I mean, it's just like, I, I, this is, this sounds so petty and shitty of me. It does come back to the story. I've come to realize this, at least where I'm at right now. You know, you're serving a story. Um, you're serving a screenplay. You're serving, you're serving the, 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 the narrative at hand. Um, ultimately, that's what we're doing as filmmakers, regardless of how non-narrative the film might be. You're, yeah. you're, but this is, and this, I guess this is, this is the problem is because, you know, there's the potential of doing it at, at, at a detriment uh, for losing the sense of cinema, right? Yeah. Which again, sounds extremely, all this sounds so pretentious. And like, if, if people just shut for. this off, it's, it's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, it's true though. It's just like, this is getting back to like the assemblage of elements for me. It's like, yeah, I'm ultimately interested in, in cinema, in, in yeah. movies, right? In the medium. Like, I mean, I think cinema has a, an incredible capacity to tell a story um, with great empathy. Um, and that's like a, it's a miracle unto itself. Um, but I, I want the whole Meshuggana, you know, I want the whole thing. I want like um, a story really well told with the medium. Yeah. So you're serving the story, but you know, just be wary of, of not losing like, you know, the kind of je ne sais quoi of what makes movies so fucking rad, you know, when they are, which is yeah. like, you know, the cinematic language, you know, the expression, you know, that's, that's, and it can work. And it honestly, it works. It can work the other way as well. It can be, you know, that could be an adverse. If you're leaning too much into style, you know, yeah. obviously we see this style over substance, you know, it's like a common, you know, you know, line. Um, I like to be very narrative, like in my mm. kind of ideation and conception of, of ideas. Um, but kind of in the process, like I like very specific about um, kind of the narrative that's in my mind. And that helps me to arrive at like very unique visuals. You know, if I, if there's like a story in my mind, yes, of that course. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then basically like kind of dust the tracks so that like, that story disappears, but those visuals remain and the story is still there, but not in a way that feels like um, spoon fed or maybe even like easy to discern. I think that's smart. And I think, this, and I think this that applies all comes, to not just music videos, but, but the larger picture. And I, I think so too. You know, if I can kind of um, not retract a statement, but kind of, you know, kind of readdress it. It's less for me because, yeah. Okay. Because obviously, you know, I see myself, at my most ideal, I see myself as a storyteller. Like, I think, you know, I, I think this is, this is pretty evident to me. Um, I think it's in, in some sort of kind of, um, uh, how to say it, um, in some sort of like rebellion away from doing this thing that I love to do. It's like, you know, naturally you want to push against that as much yeah. as possible. You want to find new forms in which you could tell a story, uh, so to speak, you know, you want to lean into the, the artifice of the medium sometimes mm -hmm. if only to embrace that because that's yeah, an expression totally. to itself. Yeah. Um, I think it's less that story is overrated. And that's such a silly thing to say. I think it's, it's, it's more to the point that plot can be overrated. Yes. 100%. Um, and and yeah. like the mechanics and so, of that. Yeah. Exactly. And I think it's funny. I have these, these debates with my father who I adore so <laughs> much about and who really raised me on film. And yeah. like to this day, will call me every night being like, I saw a good, good movie, you know, it tells me, <laughs> <laughs> it tells me what, what he saw. And, you know, oftentimes we're in um, absolute agreement. Um, but, you know, my father comes from a generation of film goers that, you know, likes his movies with like a very understandable plot. Yeah. You know, and um, 
And I think that's adorable and great. And I sometimes want that as well. You know, I mean, it depends on the day, but like, I ultimately, ultimately want people to feel anything that I make, you know, um, I, that's, that's the end expression. I think of, of what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to kind of encapsulate a feeling at any given, given moment. And I want to create a gestalt experience that can be remembered. You know, I want, I want people yeah. to remember what it feels like to, to see the thing. When I, when um, I think about what you do, Kevin, and I think, I think that um, maybe, maybe this is true for like every filmmaker. I don't know. I, Cause I, I feel like um, specifically for you and I, and I can really identify with this too, is like, um, you know, there are some filmmakers who like, l- like to, uh, um kind of like capture the world and and then kind of like tell a story through like something that feels um real i'm not talking about like documentary but i mean i mean like kind of uh recreating like what you see every day and then i think there's people like you who it's much more like uh, I think saying like create your own world feels too big. It's more like you want to create like a, this tiny corner, you know, that you want to like bring people into that's like very controlled. Um, and it's something like unto itself completely uh, as mm. opposed to like um, trying to bring like the world in, like the, the world that we see kind of in, into cinema. It's like kind of like really like gestating this like totally new vision of like, you know, for instance, like in super dark times, it's just like, you know, we're not getting into like, uh, uh, you know, like how the police are reacting to this thing that happened. Right. Really. Right. I mean, kind of parents are on the periphery. Yeah. Like it's not about like this blanket kind of like picture of like this story that takes place. And we're looking at, um, the town it's more like we're we're like this very very specific little corner that you want people to see it's interesting yeah i should preface everything i should have said this at the top of of this recording i don't know anything at all like i mean i don't (laughs) i really you know i'm totally flying by the seat of my pants here like i really i'm i'm just kind of figuring all this out as i go along um and i think that's part of the, the journey um so, you know, anything I say, obviously take with a grain of salt. Um, I don't have steadfast rules about any of this shit. Um, there's an enormous way, there's a, how to say, there's plentiful ways to kind of approach this medium yeah. as, you know, seen through all the, the you know, the myriad of incredible movies out there. Um, with Super Dark Times, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up because I do know that for me, when I hear that assessment, I think, oh, this is about perspective and it's about yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the balance between, you know, objective and subjective perspective and, you know, something about omniscience, om- omniscience, yeah. Uh, yeah, omniscient perspective kind of through that all. Um, I think in the, when, when originally kind of crafting that film, you know, there was a desire to, to create, yes, there was a desire, think back on it, um, early on to kind of stick with Zach, the sole protagonist, like, and the idea is we're not going to veer away from this character's perspective. We're going to stay with him every step of the way. So the idea of cutting, the idea of cutting away from him to an outside perspective at any given moment um, was dogmatically like incorrect. You know, it's like, we, we, we didn't do that until the end of the movie. Um, You know, uh, again, with intended dramatic purpose. Um, but for the most part, it's just like we were steadfast about like stick with him. This is, this is the emotion. This is the feeling, this is his world and his perspective. And that's what this movie is about. You know, there's a number of ways to kind of approach that movie. Like you said, it's very, I mean, yeah, you could kind of go a number of ways in terms of, of how to see how this, um, you know, you know, kind of um, this situation kind of befalls the town and how they react um, in, a, in a bigger perspective. But I mean, this, we were making a humble movie, you know, at the same time, it's just like we, we it, it served us to kind of 
to kind of Zero stay yeah. close. Exactly. Yeah. Like, w- would you want to sit down? Yeah. Let's take Super Dark Times as an example. Like, I know you yeah. didn't write, you didn't write that. Um, that. Ben and what's his writing partner's name? Luke Piotrowski. Luke. Um, they wrote it. Um, but like, you know, for you coming into direct and I don't know like what that process that they wrote it for you or exactly what that looks like. They wrote it for me. They wrote it for me. Okay. I ended up having to do a a draft, um, at the end of the, like basically we had like eight drafts and we were a couple months out from pre-production and in in an effort to kind of imbue myself into the reality of making this movie, I, I, I took two months off, went back to Pennsylvania and like just hold up and like. Yeah. did a draft on the screenplay um, in order to kind of, like I said, yeah, fall within to the world, like fall into the world a little bit, you know, yeah. and that was really conducive. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, I was, uh, what was I going to say? Oh um, yeah. I mean, if it had been like a, you know, police like procedural that focused on the same story, would that have been something that you feel like you could have, I'm just using that as like an example something that you feel like you could have like really dug into the way that you did with something that, um, you know, you actually ended up making. I think from a craft, from a craft perspective. Yeah. You know, because I do have an affinity for like the craft of, of cinema and like constructing scenes and like yeah. juxtaposition of images and, and, and creating rhythms, you know, that's all interesting to me on like a, on like a certain level. Um, but ultimately, like I'm, I'm after more than than just that. That's you know, I, I want I I'd love to be able to dive deeper. And so this movie, when it was presented to me as an idea from Ben, um, Ben really knew me. I mean, we went together, yeah. we went to school together, and we we really knew each other. And I think he knew what I was drawn to, even in a way more than I kind of was aware of myself. And so I think. I think Ben's whole concept about, Hey, this is about friendship, right? This is about frayed friendship. Um, And this is about paranoia and anxiety and like, you know, PTSD. Yeah. Um, And it's about, yeah, it's, it's about all of the kind of, you know, how to say it. Um, It, it, it's about being a teenager and, and about how teenagers are essentially emotionally unequipped to handle certain type of life situations and, and the fragility that comes with being, you know, young and white and male, you know, yeah. like that's all, all that shit. Like yeah. this is the pot and all of these ingredients are in that pot. Like that's good stuff, you know? And I'm yeah. like, that's, that's very interesting for me. And, and so so yeah, it had enough ingredients there for, for, for me to really be like, oh, well, this is, this is able to be steeped with, you know, a ton of metaphor and yeah, symbolism. Totally. And this is, this is a good canvas for cinema, you know, yeah. and this is exciting to me. Yeah. This season of Good is sponsored by Musicbed. We had the chance to sit down with their CEO, Daniel McCarthy, to talk about why Musicbed exists and how they're helping creatives further their craft. We felt like there was all these indie filmmakers and a ton of indie musicians and they needed each other. Um, like we all know, like the best films are a marriage between the moving picture and music. I view it as an ongoing ecosystem that continues to, you know, increase the value of art. It continues to allow artists to support other artists. Thanks again to Musicbed for sponsoring this season of Good. As a good listener, you can get one month subscription free if you go to musicbed.com slash good. This season of Good is also sponsored by Film Supply. Here's their CEO, Daniel McCarthy, again on what makes Film Supply the best stock footage resource for films. The footage being licensed is the footage coming out of passion projects from filmmakers, and, and it's because it is the most authentic, cinematic, and it's the it's all the stuff that all the filmmakers have put all their blood, sweat, and tears into. And it shows, like you look at a clip and you're like, oh my gosh, that's a motive. I want to use that. The guys that just go out there and shoot a day for stock, like that's not who we are. I mean, that's not what we're about. Like we're about helping filmmakers fund passion projects and seeing the footage from these passion projects actually get used in commercial ways. Thanks again to Film Supply for sponsoring this season of Good. With Film Supply, you can license stock footage from world-class filmmakers like El Ginter, Diego Contreras, Massio Frost, and more. Plus, if you're short on time, they have free footage research, 
available to help you find exactly what you need. Learn more at filmsupply.com. No. I mean, <laughs> I remember two instances <laughs> when I actually ended up moving out to Los Angeles, right? So I signed with a paradigm as a cinematographer. Yeah. I was young as hell. I had no idea what I was doing. That moved me out to LA. Yeah. I was crashing on Jet Steiger's floor, like underneath his table or something, like in his kitchen. And I remember specifically, like one day I went out to have like sushi with Jet, which I could barely afford. And yeah. <laughs> he had been out in LA working at the director's bureau for about two years at that point. And I remember asking him, like, hey, like, what do I do? You know, like, I remember he just, like, he looks at me and he's like, if you're asking me how to, like, make it in this industry, I have no fucking idea, right? <laughs> and, you know, I was like, okay. And, like, to this day, it's like, you know, it's like this kind of, you know, intangible question. And I remember, like, typing into Google one afternoon, like, how to, like, live life. Like, I have no idea. I had no idea what the fuck I was doing. The only benefit I can say, that carried over from the college experience was that it produced enough of these talented people that we were talking about yeah, that I yeah. was so blessed to befriend that yeah. at this point had moved, so half of them had moved out to New York, half of them moved out to LA. And there was an establishment of, of talent that came from the school that in turn met other kind of graduates from other schools like Emerson and stuff. And we created something of a community that, that tends to just happen. And I was able to kind of just work my way up, you know, shooting yeah. things. I was working as a cinematographer. And then over time, I would like direct things on the, slot, on the side. Um, and then I would get wrecked as a director at Black Dog. And then that would fall apart because that shit is just fucking messy. And then, you know, and then I, it's I just like it. this path. You know yeah. it, man. It's just like this path. Um, uh, and I had no idea that you, you were at Black Dog, by the way. That's I did that video. Okay, so I did a video for the band Mum. Um, oh, called that Sing was Along. at Black Dog. No, okay, no, that was beforehand. That was produced by Jet and Josh Lind. Um, so that was like a Ways and Means Dandy Dwarves collab, right? Doing the Tenet thing here. <laughs> um, but <laughs> <laughs> it's what it was. It was like this kind of collaboration. And it was literally at that point, and even looking back on it, it was easily one of the best experiences of my life. Yeah. Making that thing was un. It's an amazing video. Yeah. Well, it's funny because when you're talking about the video for Gloria, that was just my whole intention. I'm like, let me just do, let me just yeah, do this. I get that. Here, yeah. right? Let me just say, like, kind of take this concept of doing these micro moments and telling this big story in these micro moments that are very mm. specific yeah, and let's that. just do it here and, and see how that plays like a roller coaster or like, you know, some sort of like effervescent kind of explosion. Um, I, I have a question and so, for you real quick. Yeah. 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 I don't, I don't want to interrupt your flow. Well, no, no, I mean the, 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 the basic, I mean, I'm fucking rambling. The basic gist is that, yeah, I did that video that got me noticed at black dog. They signed me. I never did any work with them ever. <laughs> and, and you know, and then time just that makes me feel passing. so much better. That's good to hear. Oh, dude, it's all a fucking sham. I mean, it's like I, I mean, it's it's how to say it. It's just messy, man. It's yeah. just messy. Yeah. yeah, I don't want to sound spiteful. No, um, no, because no. I'm not. It's not about anyone like, specific. It's just like the like the certainly that industry. not. Yeah. yeah, the industry is brutal, man. It's it brutal. brutal, and like you know, to this day, like I don't know, I don't really really regret any of any any. I don't I, how to say it. I'm not. I don't hold any anger or anything over any of it because I'm, I don't know. I got, I'm, I'm where I'm at right now and I'm not mad at my life, you yeah. know, like, I mean, everything happened to, I don't know, for some fucking reason or something, yeah. you know? I think, I think, you know, for me, I've had like the fear of, I mean, to be quite honest, it's not about any company or anybody that I worked with specifically. I think it's m more about like me, versus <laughs> the process of working in, in like the commercial realm and like kind of not to be like whatever, but kind of like higher level, like uh, uh, music video stuff is like, yeah, it's really, it doesn't jive with me, <laughs> you know, like, uh, and I, and I, not that I can't do it, but um, just that process is kind of soul sucking. And I feel like I, I look back at like, you know, periods of time that I was like with a company or another co and it's like I feel like sometimes it's like I signed with that company and I almost immediately stopped making interesting work you mm. know or I entered this kind of like 
phase of the industry. And I, and, and I guess all that to say, like, I, I've, I had, I've had similar experiences where I look back at work that I've made more with like my friends and um, kind of outside of like that bureaucracy and kind of like long for making that kind of stuff again you know, there's, there's a design. No, I totally, I totally hear this. And I think it's like, yeah, there's a, there's always going to be an innate desire to kind of imbue that type of, you know, gusto or verve that you have managed to yield from this type of work that you've made, that you've become so passionate about the stuff that you look back upon where you're like, that was a great experience. And that was a great product, so to speak. Um, like I say, I hate saying product. That was a great fucking film or whatever the hell. Um, <laughs> there's always the desire to take that, like, like, yeah, encapsulate that type of energy and drive it into whatever commercial type yeah. of production that you're kind of being part of. Because you're like, why not? Like at the, at, at the end of the day, it's just like, how do I make this as radical and good as possible? Like, you know, like, otherwise, what am I doing? I'm just like, you know, but- making a buck. And that's, yeah. Do you see, I mean, I look at that now as like a bit of like a naive take. For instance, <laughs> you and I worked on a, a music video together where I think I went in with the idea of, um, you know, uh, I'm going to reinvent how we make pop videos. <laughs> right. <laughs> I remember. And, yeah, um, like, yeah, and, it, and that wasn't the case, you know, like the, there are guard guardrails set up. Uh, you got, to, Yeah, you got to you got to know, know the game you're playing. Right. And I like, didn't. Yeah. And and I think maybe that's part of what I'm saying is like, if like, oh, um, I think you whatever. did. I think you did. I think you did just what you needed to do. No, you know, don't, don't I, try to solve this. It was, uh, it was fine. It was a fine it. video. But they, yeah, ultimately like, you know, it's, you're working within a world that has its, its walls already built, you know, like it has and, no and interest sur- in what I'm interested in. Uh, you were interested in <laughs> that we were trying to do together. <laughs> it had a little bit of interest, but you know, only to a certain degree. Yeah. I think this is the thing is like, yeah, if you go in with like lofty ambitions and expectations uh, that are immovable, um, you're going to get your heart broken time and time again. Yeah. And this is, this is something I've personally learned over the 12 years I've lived in this fucking city, you know, which is like, you know, temper your expectations, you know, know, know the game that you're playing. Yeah. Ultimately. Like know when to go all out and and know when to go all out. Exactly. Like, and honestly, when I did the, when I was considering the Lumineers project, I mean, bless these guys, bless them for, for giving me this opportunity, but for also giving me the autonomy um, and the, and the room to really, really i don't know ex- express how I, I felt it should be expressed um yeah to like and do wanted it, to to really do it yeah exactly yeah. it was like you know and it, it really came down to a conversation um where it was like look if we're gonna do this we're gonna like do it you know yeah. we're gonna like go for it otherwise what's the point yeah. you know um this shit takes too much time it takes too much energy like if you're gonna invest this much cash into something like this um then make it God fearing, you know, make it, make it as rad as possible. And I mean, again, that's, a, this, this, that's a great band um, filled yeah. with like really strong ideals, you know? Yeah. And so I owe, I owe them all of that. Um, but there's not going to, not every project is going to be like that at all. Like, as, and, yeah. And I, and I think it was like a learning curve and I'm sure you learned it earlier. I'm still on. learning it, Jerry. Yeah. Like <laughs> t- totally. I mean, are you kidding me, man? Like it's it's yeah. We want to make uh, everything great, you know? Yeah, you got. It. Yeah, you you have to. Yes, that's like the the, is, de- the deadly part of it is like I think you have to have that desire. I think you have to be like naive enough to think that like everything can be great. Um, but then I don't know, I, I don't know, like kind of knowing also, like what you said, there are walls kind of put in place, like just knowing what you're walking into and knowing, like, I don't, I don't mean to sound like, like cliche, but knowing whether it can be art or if it's going to be like uh, a product. <laughs> like we I, I think, I think completely, um, it's, it's not cliche. I think that's, well, it sure it is, but if only because it's so abundant, you know, this, this, yeah. this, this concept is like. Yeah, like 
you don't want to be zapped of ambition ever. Yes. Like, exactly. because then that's like the death, the death hole or whatever. Like, you know, that's yeah. like, and that's, and so I think it's about like, if you want to work in this industry as, as a filmmaker, it's like, well then work in this industry as a filmmaker like what you know like work yeah. work with the industry because this is a machine that you're uh, you know falling into it is um yeah. you can kind of change it bit by bit you know inch by inch but you know ultimately you're going to want to save you're going to want to save your heart <laughs> for the things that you can really apply it to you yeah. know so do the craft you know, craft the fuck out of it. Do bring yeah. bring your sensibilities to it, <laughs> and when they immediately hit a wall, I'll be like, okay, no problem. Yeah, we'll exactly. Like, yeah. And then just move on, you know, and then move on. Like take the money and run, as my friend <laughs> United used to say. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, no, I get that. Um, I get that. I think you know. This is again. I'm. I'm. I still feel new to this, right? In a yeah. way, like I, yeah. Um, and you just learn bit by bit how to play it. You know, um, it's always, and that's kind of part of the joy, the broad joy of, of filmmaking is that, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an industry that keeps modulating itself as time passes, as new technology yeah. comes to fray, as new obstacles come to pass, such as this COVID thing and stuff. Um, it changes the, the overall infrastructure of the medium, but as right. much as, as much as like the purpose of it. You know, the purpose of all of this is changing dramatically, at least yeah. commercially, yeah. you know. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's cool to be the person that's just like, let's make this fucking rad. Let's make this as cool as can be, you know, and, yeah. and absolutely that like for the sake of the world, you want to be in, in doing that but ultimately at the, at the end of the day you know this is all for capitalist gains you know like you know it's not in a way it's not art but yet it can be a little bit and it's like i don't know it's tricky so so yeah make your movie you know that's what, that's what i'll say it's like you gotta make your movie Doing my best um tell me about i, I don't mean uh well Tell me about kind of like the uh, the transition from you know DP mm. to really starting to like helm some projects on your own. Like, what did that look like? Well, where did that like? What was the has the desire always been like there, or did that develop, or what did that kind of what did that transition? And are you still? I don't even know if you are. Are you still DPing full time as well? Now that's a, that's a great question. I don't. I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I got, I'm, I'm on a job um, to shoot something tentatively at the end of the month um, as a cinematographer. I love cinematography. You know, it's yeah. like, I mean, my time as a cinematographer has um, only enabled me to direct the way that, you know, that I have been able to, so to speak. Yeah. I, I studied cinematography to be a better director in college. That mm -hmm. was, that was the whole idea. And then I fell in love with the, the craft of it. Yeah. I fell in love with working with crew. Um, I loved the relationship um, between a director and a cinematographer. Yeah. I loved the, the, again, the mechanics and the optics of a, of a camera and, and what that means to, to cinema and, and to, to filmmaking. Um, because for me, even early and, and to this day, it was, you know, storytelling in, within movies is about the relationship of a lens to the subject, to the background. You know, that's yeah. Yeah. like, this is, this is where the emotion's at. This is where the context is at. This is everything. Yeah. Um, and so I always felt, well, this is common sense. As a director, you're going to want to understand this language that you're using. And yeah. so I need to, I need to. You know, it, it, it for me it was almost hard to kind of to kind of split those two roles early totally. on. It's just like these that. are yeah. so yeah. I know, and I know you do. You know, I thought I thought it's like essential to you know as a director, you're going to want to know what your emotional relationship to a 35 millimeter lens is to a, you know a 60 or a 40, and like what that feels and how that's different. And then it, it, it kind of spread itself out to it's like, well, as a director, you should know as much as you can 
not just about cinematography, but about every department. Because if, you know, it, it just carries over that same kind of mindset where it's just like, the more you know, the more you're equipping yourself with the tools and, and the grammar to kind of tell whatever story you're telling um, in the way you want to tell it. Um, because ultimately it's all about communication, right? You're all, it's all about communicating with not just your cast, but with the crew and speaking to each individual on their own level. That's like the core of directing, right? Yeah, yeah, um, totally. And so I, yeah, I studied cinematography to be a better director. I fell in love with cinematography. Um, I was shooting my own movies in college mainly out of some arrogance because I'm just like, I don't trust anybody else. Right? Totally you know, but, <laughs> but, but, you know, I mean, time, the times have changed. Um, and for tell, the better, tell, me about, where, tell me about handing over yeah. the camera for the first time. That's too cool for school. Um, no, even before that month. Um, so I met, you know, I met Eli Bourne in college um, and I did not, we we did not really like each other. Eli, Eli is a gentle, <laughs> a gentle boy. I think he liked me, but I was a, I was, I was probably a little standoffish. And I just was, I, I had a hard time trusting anybody. I didn't have many friends in high school. And so I think going into college, which really was a unique experience um, where I started to feel finally, like these are my people. Yeah, I still yeah. carried with me a lot of hurt and pain about, about meeting new friends. And Eli, I felt was so, was so kind that I'm like, I can't trust this guy at all, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. But so, so come, come to moving to LA right thereafter, or near thereafter, I, I moved in with Eli and Ed Unitas and, um, and Eli and I became like best buddies. And I've, I've actually, you know, even while in college, I always admired what Eli was doing. I always yeah. thought he was like quite talented. And as time passed, um, his talent naturally only grew. And we spent so much time together. Um, and working together on, on a number of different things. And the mum, the mum video was one of the first things we actually like really did as a team uh, yeah. where he was shooting for me, you know, mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to, I, I wanted Eli to shoot it. I want, I yeah, didn't want yeah. to, to DP it. I'm like, I want to, I want to be the type of filmmaker that works with cinematographers. I don't want to yeah. be the prick. That's just like, you know, not to say that Soderbergh's a prick. I love, you know, again, I love the dude. But I, I wanted to just have the experience, the rounded experience. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to grow into that type of person. Were you still pretty, and pretty handsy with the camera? I'm not, I, w I wasn't handsy. No, I, I mean, I, I can be very specific about lenses um, and where I think the camera should be. But it's a very fluid relationship um, where I, I realize um, I've come to realize that a director's responsibilities, you know, are far reaching. Um, and I can, and, and I have found nothing but joy through actually being a cinematographer and working with directors. I have found nothing but joy in the process of collaborating on, on the, on the story you're telling. Um, and so the respect I have for that relationship has only carried itself forward as the roles have been reversed. Um, I know how hard it is to be a cinematographer. Exactly. I know what it, what, yeah, what, yeah. what's called upon. Um, and working with somebody like Eli or working with Wyatt, you know, I mean, it's been an absolute joy yeah. um, because I, you know, when I'm, when I'm watching them work and I'm, you know, I'm like, I can't do that. Mm. Like, these, these motherfuckers, I can't do what they're doing. That kind of changes um, everything, doesn't it? At least in, in my, a way, it, you're you're like an insanely uh, much more accomplished DP than I mean I, I wouldn't even call myself a DP ever, but enough that I I could shoot my own stuff. But I I was I was doing enough on my own to not trust other people, you know, like where I even even like at, at points where like they could kind of DP, but I had to operate kind of thing, and then really like finding people who were like far superior to me. Yeah. And like they were doing stuff that I couldn't do felt like yeah. the release that I kind of needed to be like, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It it's funny because like I've had to shoot like in quarantine this past, this past year, like I've, I've had to direct like three commercials and I had to essentially shoot them myself as well. And I mean, that was fine. And that was kind of, it, it was pragmatic. It was practical. 
um, it was necessary. And I, and I love it. You know, I love it. I mean, it's just, it's a, um, how to say it, it, it comes, you know, firsthand for me. Um, but the opportunity to work with talented cinematographers, talented any department really is just like, it's a joy as a director. And so too cool for school. Eli came on to shoot it and like gangbusters. This is a great mm -hmm. relationship. Yeah. I mean, as if it needed to be proven at that point. Yeah. Um, and there was no question that he was going to shoot super dark times. And that relationship um, was as fluid as can be. And again, yeah, I, 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 I work in a way um, that tends to be very specific um, when called for about lenses and camera systems, um, yeah, whether it yeah. be a dolly, a steady cam, a tripod, any, all that shit. And knowing those tools just mm. helps me kind of communicate with the cinematographer and it really kind of eases the communication. And again, it's just to say pragmatic it is. It's an efficient, pragmatic kind of um, through line to the process. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it helps kind of, I don't know. It, it helps kind of ease the process, you know? Yeah. Well, it's interesting watching you work with Eli and Wyatt, both of whom um, I was very aware of when I was still in school, Wyatt, especially. Yeah. Um, it's interesting seeing them shoot, for you because you know i remember um i remember wyatt shooting some stuff for uh i don't know this guy only through the internet but uh like weston curry is he still oh, i love weston i um, love weston yeah and seeing wyatt kind of interpret what he was doing um was so beautiful and i and then mm. I, I think and, and and knowing wyatt's work um you know and kind of like his sensibility but seeing like the two of you which i you know i think Maybe I'm wrong, but at least in my in my um, kind of uh, knowledge of what Wyatt does and what you do, it seems like kind of maybe not too into the spectrum, but like um, I don't know something about you guys kind of coming together on on uh, Lumineers project was pretty exciting for for me. You know, it's like because you are fully still there, you know, but also Wyatt sensibilities are also very present too, and just that combination was. I don't know. I guess, I guess, you know, stepping away from the camera, how are you communicating to like whether I, uh, uh, Eli, Wyatt, whoever, um, I'm curious the like the communication system is kind of like, yeah, I mean, it was, it, uh, to reiterate, I mean, it was an absolute joy in, in each respect. I, I consider Wyatt and Eli so very excellent and talented. And, yeah. um, with, with both of them, it was a very similar process. I mean, naturally you're speaking to each of these people who are their own individual selves with their own kind of communication methods yeah. in their own ways. But I was benefited from being very, very close friends with both of them. It helps. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and so um, working, I mean, these are professionals, you know, and yeah. like they are there to like do a great job, you know, for every reason. And so um, it's an extremely fluid uh, process um, where, again, the, like, the Lumineers demanded specificity in a way. Yeah. Moreover, Super Dark Times, which was even a very precise movie. Um, but there is a bit more, you know, I don't know. You're always pivoting. You're always going in with a previsualization. You're always changing things up. Um, I, I work big on, I'm, I'm big on scouting. I'm, I'm big on prep. Um, and with something like the Lumineers where, again, you're approaching it very practically and pragmatically, I think any job you kind of are ultimately, um, but you know, where we were, the ambition was high and we're trying to do a much within a very short amount of time. Um, it's about not just suggesting what's going to happen down to the millimeter of the lens and where the camera should be and the quality of light, because you can say all that stuff. Yeah. Um, but then it's asking in turn, what do you think? What do yeah, you think? Yeah. What do you think? How about here? What do you think? You know, it's a, it's a back and forth. It's a give and take. Um, and it's very seamless and it's filled with passion um, on both ends. And, and that, that yields an extremely rewarding experience um, where, you know, 
certain things again have to be really planned out but um your work your your you're in it together uh kind of um weathering the 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 inevitable like um how to say it um changes that will befall production sure. you know at any yeah. given moment um you you don't you don't feel so alone with your fucking totally. thoughts, you know, at yeah. any given moment, you know, well, um, there's, had, there's reassurance and stuff. I definitely have had situations when I've worked with certain DPs that I have felt alone <laughs> for mm. sure. But um, yeah, when you're able to like, especially if there's a relationship there, I guess that could go either way. If you had a friendship that was kind of tested in a uh, professional space, sometimes that doesn't go so well, but um, it was with people like Wyatt and, and Eli, um, they're both, they're both extremely curious people to begin with, you yeah. know? Um, and so, and, and again, they're invested in doing great work, but they really, they really want to dig in. They yeah. really want to like kind of get to the core of any given moment in the story you're telling. Right. And, and react ac accordingly. And so yeah. they're, they'll always have suggestions. They'll always have ideas. Um, and they're never, and, and again, just to their professionalism and, and just to the makeup of them as individuals, like they're never, um, how to say it, they fight for what they believe in, but they, but they move, you know, they flow like water, these guys, both yeah. of them. They, they're really, they're really beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I want you to tell me um, about Too Cool for School mm -hmm. and your experience at can and kind of how that led to... Uh, um super dark times so we okay so super dark times was conceptualized maybe about four or five years before we actually ended up making it ben approached me with the idea we had been juggling ideas to make into a film um we went for a walk because he had a dream that he wanted to talk to me about and he basically kind of spieled the the kind of the middle of the movie the core kind of inciting incident and he's like, you know, as he was talking, he got more excited. And he basically was <laughs> saying, I think this is it. I think I should write this and you should direct it. Wow. And I'm like, hold your horses. You know. <laughs> but he, he went off and did it. He went and like, he wrote a rough draft in like the span of like seven days or something like that. And then um, it was exciting and enticing. And he brought on his partner, Luke Piotrowski, and they did uh, a second draft. And the film really started to take form you know, and we started a note giving process. And then we attached Jet Steiger, graduate from SCAD, um, and good friend and owner of Ways and Means. Um, as a producer, he bought the option over a steak dinner at Dan Tana's. And that was that, you know, and so we're like, we're gonna make this movie. And then years pass, you know, and we're all growing in our respective fields. I'm shooting and directing when I can little shorts on the side and stuff like that, all finding our way. And the movie kind of just gestates, right? Um, we kind of every now and then Is that apply. In a way, but at the same time, I wasn't fully attached to the idea of making this movie. Every mm. every instance of of some sort of, you know, um, how to say it, like every I recall every instance of like a school shooting. Mm. would send like you know naturally a shiver through the whole process yeah. of making a movie like this that's a bad it's very much about like you know it, suburban violence and like yeah. teen violence and um and the process naturally took it's, it took time because ultimately we were trying we were inexperienced feature filmmakers trying to make a movie that very little people, very few people wanted to make, you know, this is like, you know, <laughs> um, difficult themes, no star cast, you know, it's like, and like, you know, untested uh, director. Um, yeah. It's like, good luck a little bit, you know, but, um, but we held on to it. And then, and then Richard Pete, um, also graduate from SCAD and owner of the production company Neighborhood Watch in New York, um, was vying for my attention. And he reached out and um, we started working together and we became really close friends as well. And Richard asked early on, he's like, what's up with this movie, Super Dark Times? And 
I was like, uh, how, how early did you, you land know, on that title, by the way? Immediately. Immediately. <laughs> I, this, th- honestly, within the first draft that Ben wrote, I started writing down titles as potentials. Um, because I like, I'm, I'm of the mindset where I like to kind of have a title early on. I get you. Um, and even yeah, this is, this is funny, but it's true. The, the title font on the movie to this day was the, ti- was, I wrote that out. Mm. That's, it's the same thing. It's like, it's like a, a JPEG that I took from a picture yeah, and like, yeah. you know, so that's, yeah. that was, that was an early, yeah, that was in, that was from the onset pretty much. Yeah. Um, Richard Pete. Yep. came on board asked about the movie what's happening with this thing we're like i don't know it's just kind of sitting around we'd like to make it but you know and richard just came off making blue ruin with jeremy Songe. and yep. so he was like kind of high on this adrenaline of being like we can do it man we can like make this thing you know yep. we don't need much and i was enticed and i'm like okay but i got jet steiger over here who's already attached to this and as jet once told me you know a producer needs another producer like they need a hole in their head you know and so it's like get, they, this is going to be hard to marry these guys together but i love Did them they know each other at much. the time not really okay. um they were aware of one another um but um not not per se and so i thought i'm um, like this could be very beneficial this could benefit the project in, in so many ways and i like the idea of having these two people that i love very much coming together to support this movie on different coasts. I think that's great. And so that process of kind of bringing them together was unto itself like a huge challenge that I had to really marinate and like kind of, you know, work with over time. But I did. Yeah. And um, Richard had the idea, hey, let's do a short proof of concept. Jeremy did it for Blue Ruin. Um, and that could benefit this movie because at this point we had a very big treatment, like a lookbook deck that I had made. We How had big? How many pages? 42, something like that. Okay. Um, uh, very detailed though. Um, we had um, about eight drafts of the screenplay. We had all the stuff we needed except like a, a testament to making a movie that, you know, so to speak. Sure. So, He's like, let's do a short. And I'm like, okay, but I don't want to just do a scene from the movie because if we end yeah. up making this movie, how fucking boring just to reshoot that fucking scene that we already shot. So let's do something that can exist. That's part of this universe yeah, of super right. dark times, but can exist unto itself. Right. Like that's cool and interesting. So Ben had written a small kind of little, very, very thin, so to speak. And I'm not, not, to, not to say this is like a, no, it's just like a very simple, um, story about this kid coming home and like porn playing in his house or something. I don't really really remember. (laughs) Um, And and there was like a suspense element to it. Um, I fleshed it out a bit. um, And we had the idea collectively. I'm like, look, I'm going home for Thanksgiving. Let's just scout. I could scout in Pennsylvania. This would be great to shoot in Pennsylvania. Super Dark Times is always a Northeastern movie. So I'm like, I know where I'm from quite well. I know the landscape. It could be really inspiring and cool. We could shoot it in my family's house. No problem. Much to, much to their, you know, <laughs> chagrin or whatever. Like they, they, you know, they allowed it, but you know, we totally took over that fucking house. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, we kind of put this thing together real quickly and following Thanksgiving, you know, we brought up a team of, incredible people, Jet, Rich, Eli, um, and brought a bunch of friends over from New York, Ryan Dickey, Colin Alexander, uh, Abby Horton, um, uh, Patrick Parker, gosh, so many. Um, and the, we just said, yeah, we hu- kind of huddled in my home and in like a hotel complex for like four days. Uh, we cast Tristan Lake Labou out of LA and uh esther um from los angeles as well and then we like kind of just shot this thing with yeah. no real uh expectation other than let's make this cool thing you know 10 11 minutes long planned for it shot it in a very specific way yeah. um and i was home for the holiday and i needed to shoot a bunch of inserts for the movie and i remember just me and this red camera that I borrowed 
um, from Neighborhood Watch, and I was just shooting these inserts at my house to kind of fill in the gaps. Ed Unitas cut the movie in LA like real quickly. And then Richard and Jet had the idea, like, let's send this off to Cannes. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> like, good luck. And they did. And then I remember I was in um, Venice, Italy at the time, shooting something for a filmmaker named Oscar Boyson, who I love. And I was with Colin Alexander, our sound, our brilliant sound designer. And basically we got the word then and there that the movie was accepted into um, uh, Critics Week at Cannes. Um, which was fantastic. Yeah. And, um, you know, shortly thereafter, we find ourselves in Cannes. And at this point, though, you know, we kind of were communicating with UTA um, and a couple of companies like XYZ um, about Super Dark Times. And so once we got to Critics Week, it really kind of opened how, the sorry, door. How, did, how, Becca, how yeah. did that kind of come about? Yeah. How did the conversation start to come about? Well, Given that Jet had had you know come off of producing Lake Bell's feature film, right? Um, and Rich produced Blue Ruin. This they naturally opened doors for themselves. Ben and Luke had you know were working their way up at the, with the WGA, writing other films as well. We all kind of started excelling a little bit yeah. in our, in our yeah. own fields, right? And so that naturally kind of opened more avenues of approach with this screenplay and this project. And now that we had this proof of concept as well, um, that helped, that only helped. And now that it went to can as well, that only helped even further. Yeah. And so critics week was really cool, you know, small, humble aspect of the festival, but it was cool nonetheless. Um, I mean, can is great when it's, when it's great. It's like fucking great, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's totally fun. Um, and it was, we met with UTA um, literally the day I got back from can in New York city, uh, Richard, Pete and I, I mean, still like absolutely jet lagged and like, <laughs> you know, like hung over or whatever from that entire venture, like meeting at UTA um, and basically like, this is the movie we want to make and here's everything. And they're like, this sounds fucking cool and great. And, you know, we believe in you. Um, let's try to get this going. Let's like try to find some financiers for you. And we're like, great. And pretty much right thereafter, we started a six month process of meeting with different financiers. And at that point in time, it was very evident. It will became more evident, I should say, to myself and to Jet and Richard and the team entire, what kind of movie we wanted to make. Yeah. Um, and so it was much a vetting process for us as it was for the financiers. Is this something that they want to make? Right. And we were not shy about the type of movie that we wanted to make, you know, um, because we wanted to, if we we're going to do it, we wanted to do it the right way. Um, and the long and short of it is, you know, we found two fantastic co-financiers um, and that really believed in the project and really were predominantly hands off. And then as things kind of came to a head, I mean, I realized like, oh fuck, we're gonna like make this movie. And I remember I was with Richard and we were at a friend's wedding in Iceland and we were like a little wine drunk and we got into an argument because I was getting nervous about making this movie. And he's like, if you're so fucking nervous, why don't you go like storyboard the film or something? Just like work on it, like, you know? I'm like, I guess you're right. <laughs> and so I went, I, I flew back to Pennsylvania and I, st I hung out, I like hold up, like I said, for like two months and I worked on the film. Mm -hmm. And I really kind of had to come to a place where I'm like, this is going to happen. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so I better just like, you know, buckle up and decide right now, like, am I going to, am I going to do this thing? And if I'm going to do it, I really need to go all the way. Um, yeah. How many, how many days did you guys shoot? 30. 30. 30, 30, 31 counting one pickup day. Yeah. That's pretty, that's pretty. Um, yeah. That seems like uh, not in totally insane. I mean, it was desired from the onset. I mean, I remember like, you know, I kind of went to the guys with that in mind, I'm like 30 days and they're like, okay, we could do it 27. And I'm like, I don't think so. And then they're like, <laughs> we're going to do 24. And I'm like, no fucking chance. You know, yeah, and then yeah. it moved itself back up to 30. I mean, this is brilliant producing to be able to yeah. take the budget that we had 
yeah. and kind of stretch it. But we knew what we were t- the type of movie we were trying to make. A very pre-visualized, blocking intensive movie with, you know, yeah. really young talent in the dead of winter, you know? Did, did knowing the constraints, I'm curious how, um, maybe like in general, as a director, how reactive you find yourself? Like, um, or, or, you know, talking about storyboarding, um, was everything pretty meticulously plotted out? going into it i don't really storyboard i mean we had a storyboard artist for for two scenes uh, sutton bell also graduate from scad wonderful person um uh, who actually worked in the lumineers project as well but i i tend to not storyboard um i'm a sh- i'm, I'm a extensive shot lister yeah. um uh i do photo boards when it makes sense you know um but for the most part you know, we go in with an ex- with a predetermined blocking in mind. But as it, as you know, as it goes, you want to be you want to be um, you want to make room and space for everybody, and that means yeah. the cast as well. And so you can have an idea, um, and sometimes that idea will be very specific, and other times not as much. Um, you'll know where you want to get to and where you need to get to within any yeah. given scene, um, but that but that allows you room to really improvise. If you yeah. know where you need to get to, you can kind of improvise without being blind, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. It provides more freedom. So go in with a plan, knowing the type of rhythms um, that you're after. Yeah. And then the type of tone that you're after. And, um, and then, yeah. And then, and that creates a really exciting dynamic. Totally. Ultimately, because we wanted to, we really wanted to create a language that was very composed um, very deliberate, um, yet had this kind of energy within the performance that felt, you know, um, a bit unbridled, you know, um, and, and, and very naturalistic, you know, almost hyper naturalistic. Um, and I thought that combination of elements was really exciting. Um, tell me about production just a little bit. Uh, Mm -hmm. was that in Pennsylvania as well? Where did you guys shoot? No, we ended up shooting in, New York. Tax breaks were better in New York. It was easier to, again, we were planning, this is a Christmas movie, right? So there was concern about snow in Pennsylvania. I love that you call um, it a Christmas movie. <laughs> it is, man. I mean, it, I like, listened that was, to, your, uh, to your commentary the other day, uh, kind of prepping for this. And I was, did you really? That's I cute. Did. To be honest, not I hope it was okay. <laughs> okay, that's fine. There you go. <laughs> uh, but you called it a Christmas mean, movie, and I was like, "Oh, I never." I mean, you know, I see snow and Christmas lights, but I hadn't thought of it in, like that before. I mean, yeah. I mean, I liked that kind of juxtaposition. Um, I like Christmas very much, um, <laughs> and so <laughs> I mean, I, so anyway, yeah, we, we wanted to shoot in Pennsylvania that became problematic in terms of getting crew out there and cash. Sure, right, right. Um, and so it just became more efficient to shoot New York. I was recommended by a fellow director friend, Ellis Ball. He's like, why don't you look up in Kingston? Mm. And I'm like, okay. And then Richard Pete is from Socrates area. So he's like, ah, absolutely. Let's try that. Let's That's try cool. that out. Yeah. We scouted Kingston and I kind of immediately was like, yeah, this is, this is this place. This has like kind of everything we need from the topography to um, how to say it, like um, just like the kind of uh, social structures within the town itself. Um yeah that that allowed for not only the aesthetic but for kind of the, the narrative to play out right yeah, um yeah. Mm-hmm, yeah um so yeah kingston woodstock area i'm 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 like so curious to know like what it was like uh you finish the film start sending it off i guess is generally like the reception whether it's from like just people or fans who, who like kind of latched onto it or, you know, critically, like what was that like to start to see reactions uh, emerge to the film? I mean, truthfully, you know, we made this movie with an impression that like, no one's going to see it. No one's going right. to care. Right. Um, Which is didn't... true for most movies of, of, you know, kind of the, the kind you were making, you know? And it didn't stop us from making the best movie we possibly could. If sure. anything, it kind of, you know, created like a reverse effect where we really tried. Gave you some freedom. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. 
I remember Ben Collins telling me specifically, he's like, no one's going to see this fucking weird movie. Like, so don't <laughs> like lighten up a little bit. Like, don't worry so much. Um, because the process of making a film is so daunting. And so, yeah, yeah it pulls so much out of you and so much time and, and effort and passion. And so the reception to this day, when people, people, people seem to either really like it or, or not at all. And like, <laughs> and that's like actively dislike it. Me. Yeah, some 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 people either seem to it's really polarizing. It seems people seem to fucking love it or fucking hate it. Um, you gotta take that as a compliment, though. Yeah, I think it's man. I'll take whatever you know. Ultimately, <laughs> like I am, I'm really happy. Like honestly, I'm really happy that people like this movie. That people are watching this movie at all. I, I mean, I would so say it's great. borderline like got a cult following, especially that's emerged very quickly. We'll see. I mean, that's. I don't, I, I, I can't be so, you know, I'm not gonna be presumptuous to assume any of any, anything like that as much as just say that I am so thrilled that the movie was at all released that has had yeah. any sort of reception. Um, yeah. Anytime somebody tells me that they like this movie, it, it really warms me um, because the movie was made with a ton of love. Yeah. and um a ton of heart from everybody involved and uh, i look back upon that time as I, like i said with the mum experience but this was easily one of the best experiences of my life mm. um and um yeah i mean i don't i don't know what to say like i other than you know do i wish the movie went to sundance sure do i wish the movie went to can sure you know, but it went to Tribeca, which is great. And it went to, you know, uh, NIF, which is fucking great. And like, um, I'm so pleased with any of it, you know, so to speak. Um, um, and I don't know the answer to this question, but um, has that led to other feature projects? Is there anything that you're kind of working on at the moment? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm in development of three, active development of three films at the moment. Um, all quite different um uh you know signed with uta managed at a uh, grand view um and i have an incredible support team that um you know i say that and I, yeah it makes me it makes me feel really <laughs> warm they really they say they seem to really believe in, in in me and so that's i'm really blessed um and i can only hope that um I can only hope that what I've gathered from this whole process, this whole experience of like making these, this, this movie, making these projects over time and standing by this, this, you know, idea that, you know, you surround yourself with people that you love as much as possible um, because they will be there with you through a very long process of what yeah. it is to make a movie. And they will lift you up and in turn, you'll do the same for them. And you create a cyclical kind of response of influence to one another and inspiration. And that plays to the core aspect of filmmaking, which is it's a collaborative, eclectic medium. And so I'm only hoping that moving forward, um, I can bring that notion into these films and to any project that I do as much as possible, you know, working with Ben and Luke, working with Jet and Rich, working with Eli or Wyatt, working with with Colin or Ed, any of these people, yeah. really. Um, yeah, that's that's the aim, is whatever I do, I'm going to, 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 you know, carry as many people with me as I possibly can and that can possibly endure it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, right? I love that. Don't forget, this season of Good is sponsored by MusicBed. Go to musicbed.com to check out over 700 indie artists and composers with record label quality music. And remember, as a good listener, you can get one month free off any subscription type. Just head to musicbed.com slash good and use coupon code good at checkout. This season of Good is also sponsored by Film Supply. Licensed stock footage from world-class filmmakers. And do not forget to take advantage of features like shoots and scenes. Craft an entire narrative with extensive collections featuring the same talent and settings. Plus, if you're short on time, they have free footage research available to help you find exactly what you need. Learn more at filmsupply.com.